You've launched your shop on Etsy and you've started listing products into said shop on Etsy, but all you're getting is crickets. You might be making a few mistakes that you don't even realize that you're making, which is leading to the lack of sales. As a print on demand entrepreneur, entrepreneur, I myself have made tons of different mistakes along the way, lots of mistakes. But fortunately, with my experience along the way, I've been able to identify those mistakes, make adjustments, and in turn, I've been able to see a lot of success in my business. In the last year, I've completed over 200 individual shop audits. And with those, I've definitely started to notice some common themes and common mistakes that I see new print on demand sellers making. So today I'm going to be breaking down the top five mistakes that you might be making in your print on demand business and what you can do to prevent yourself from continuing to make those mistakes and hopefully send you on the path towards your first sales on Etsy. Be sure to stick around all the way to the end as I'm going to be sharing the top mistake that I see sellers making, a mistake that most sellers think is something that is helping them, but really it's doing more harm than good. If you are new to my channel, hello, my name is Taylor. I'm a print on demand entrepreneur. And just this year I've sold over $70,000 on Etsy using a print on demand business model and have scaled my business in the last year and a half to multi six figures. If you like videos talking about print on demand, passive income or entrepreneurship as a whole, then be sure to boop the subscribe button down below so that you can stick around for future videos. Mistake number one is not understanding trademarks. Now this is a topic that I feel is talked about all the time. However, I think that there is still a lot of confusion about what you can and cannot do, what you can and cannot use. And so that's why I wanted to touch on this in this video. I'm going to break it down in just the way that I understand it, but let this be a disclaimer that I am not a legal professional. If you have any questions regarding trademarks and how, what, where, when, why you can use things and not use things, then definitely reach out to a professional. A trademark lawyer would probably be the best person to reach out to for solid information. However, the way that it was explained once to me that just seemed to make the most sense and just made it click in my brain was that if you are creating something with the intent to make a customer, an individual that you're hoping to see and purchase your product, think of something that is not your original idea, then you are likely infringing on a trademark or a copyright or something of that regard. An example, you make an item that says Gryffindor and it is very directly related to Harry Potter. This is a very obvious example and something that I think we all know would be considered infringement. However, the more common mistake that I see is creating something that actually looks more like this. This is still a direct correlation to Harry Potter, even though the design isn't using any coined phrases or anything like that, but it is using references and elements that would make somebody think of Harry Potter. And ultimately that is what is the selling point of the item that would be considered infringing on the Harry Potter name and brand, which is something that you can't do. Sometimes I'll see where a seller will make something like this and then try to use more broad keywords like wizard t-shirt, wizard lover, and just more broad phrases that aren't using the terms Harry Potter or any references to the movies. That is still not something that is okay to do because the design is still infringing on that brand. This I think is more commonly known. We know that we can't make Disney items. We know that we can't make Taylor Swift items or anything related to those movies, celebrities, TV shows, anything like that. However, there's also trademarks for lesser known things and it is your due diligence as a print on demand seller and as an e-commerce seller to be doing the research to identify if you are creating something something that is potentially trademarked. The best way to do that is to jump onto uspto.gov and go to the direct trademark search. This is the US government website where you can find any and all live pending or dead trademarks. With that being said, this is only for the US. So if you are selling your products internationally, you are offering shipping to different countries outside of the US, you also need to be doing your due diligence in researching trademarks and copyrights in other countries. That is the reason why I personally do not sell my products internationally because trying to understand trademarks for one country like the US alone is a daunting task. And I don't want to necessarily have to worry about that for 
several other countries as well. Anytime you are putting any type of word or phrases on a product that you're selling, it is best to put that word or phrase into the trademark search and see if there's any active trademarks for it. For example, the word boy mom, I'm putting this in because this is something that I know is actively a trademark. Typically when I do a trademark search, I like to jump over to the left here and just uncheck the dead trademarks. I am really only interested in seeing what is live registered. And I do like to leave pending on because something that is a pending trademark is something that is in the process of potentially becoming a trademark. It doesn't necessarily mean that it will get cleared. However, it is something that could be great to keep an eye out for if it's something that you are using on your product. When you're doing your trademark research, you should scroll through the live and pending trademarks that you are looking for to potentially match with the keyword or phrase that you're looking to use. You want to look for anything that is live and registered, keep an eye on the things that are pending. And if it's registered and specifically registered in the code for the product type that you're looking to create, then that is not a safe sell for you to have in your shop. I'm going to link to the article on the USPTO website that has a list of all of their goods and services codes so that you can skim through and get familiar with the codes that are associated with the product types that you're looking to sell in your business. Mistake number two is using descriptive SEO. What I mean by this, if we have this shirt here, the most common mistake that I see done is the title will begin by saying easily persuaded by tacos t-shirt. The issue with this is the phrase easily persuaded by tacos is not highly searched for on Etsy. And because Etsy works as a search engine, if you have words or keywords in your title that nobody's typing into the search bar, then your product is not likely going to be found. If it's not going to be found, then it's not going to get any sales and then you're sitting in the crickets of no sales. I see this most often done when somebody's selling a product that has a quote on it and starting their title with that specific quote. Now, don't get me wrong, there are times where there are specific trending quotes or phrases that are being searched for. However, that also brings us back to mistake number one with trademarks. Sometimes if something is being highly searched for, it also can be a trademarked phrase and that's why it is so well known and so actively searched for. So be sure to be checking for trademarks. But I think most of the time we want to try to target what our potential customer is more realistically going to be typing into the search bar. This requires a little bit of reverse engineering of our thought process when it comes to what we're going to be including in our title and tags. But in this example, with our taco shirt, something that might be more actively searched for would be something like shirt for Cinco de Mayo or Cinco de Mayo shirts, taco shirts, funny taco shirts. These are all more common phrases that a customer would more likely be typing in the search bar and find our easily persuaded by tacos shirt, see it, resonate with it and think, hmm, this is exactly what I need for what I'm looking for and purchase it. And we can see here a little bit more about the search volume for these types of keywords. Your goal and what I encourage you to look for are keywords that have high search, low competition. I know you've probably heard that time and time again, but I cannot emphasize enough keyword research and looking for these keywords that are being searched for is going to help your shop out tremendously. This also goes hand in hand with mistake number three, which is not using your full title and tags to optimize your listing. With your Etsy listing, you have the ability to have a title full of 140 characters and you have 13 tags that are up to 20 characters each. When it comes to your SEO, and when I say SEO, I'm referring to your title and your tags. When it comes to what those should look like, I like to go directly to the source and see exactly what Etsy suggests. Here's what Etsy says about your titles. Keywords in your title can help you match with a shopper's query, trying to match what that customer is typing into the search bar. But they're just one of the factors that Etsy search looks at. Etsy search looks at all of the information that you add, including your categories and attributes to find keywords that match a shopper's search. For the title specifically, they recommend focusing on writing short, clear, descriptive titles that make it easy for shoppers who are scanning a busy search results page to see what you're selling. Lead with the keywords that best describe what your item is, since that's what shoppers see first when browsing. Etsy also has this article that shares their factors in Etsy's search placement and how your tag and title relevancy 
plays a role in that. So what they say is that items in Etsy search results must match the buyer's search word or phrase. Items that do not match a buyer's search won't be included in results. So if you're using more of that descriptive SEO and just describing exactly what your item has on it or what it looks like, then you probably aren't going to match that customer search. For example, the search banana backpack will only return items that match both banana and backpack in either the listings tags or titles. Once the search algorithm finds all of the items that match the search, we also use keywords to determine the order of those results. Exact phrase matches are stronger than matches on individual words. For example, a search for a banana backpack would return all items with the words banana and backpack in the tags or title, but the items with banana backpack in the title would be considered a closer match. If a word or phrase in a buyer's search appears in both the title and tags of a listing, the search algorithm considers that listing more relevant than a listing with that word or phrase in the tags or title alone. My biggest takeaway when I first learned about this was that immediately when I start creating my tags for my listings, I take my title and put it into the tags for this reason, so that I am not only trying to target that exact query match, but I'm also catering to how Etsy factors these tags and titles into my search results and my search placement and ranking for my potential customer. So I want those keywords in both my title and tags to be held at a higher rank than a listing that only has those words in just one or the other. The last thing that Etsy shares here is that words at the beginning of titles are considered more important than words at the end. This means that you want to put your best foot forward in the beginning of that title. Put your best keyword, your most relevant keyword at the beginning of your title to help improve your chance at getting visibility and getting your product seen on that first page of search results. Mistake number four is poor quality listing images. There are five types of listing images that I recommend any print on demand seller have in their listing for any product type that they're selling. First is having the mock-ups, high quality mock-ups. Second is product highlights. Is there any key information about the product that the customer would want to know or needs to know to help influence that decision? Third is sizing information. So I think often we think about apparel, we think about a size chart, but this is relative to anything that you're selling. We need to know how big it is, no matter what it is. Fourth is color information. So color chart for an apparel item, or if you are selling a different product type, like a mug, does it come in different colors? Does it have accent colors? What does the product look like? And are there different variations available? And last, having some type of validation or social proof. I have an entire video dive into the listing images and these five listing images and exactly what they look like, what they could look like, and how you can do this for your own shop that I will have linked down below. Mistake number five is having a diluted focus. A lot of times I like to compare this to reading, say, 10 different books, but you only read the first page of each. You can't really say with that whether or not the book is good because you only read the first page. You're not deep enough into it. And I feel that same idea applies to somebody who's designing for tons of different product types in tons of different niches. They end up being so shallow in all of those different product types and all of those different niches that they don't really know if they would or would not see success with it yet because they haven't dived deep enough into it. Having a diluted focus is going to lead to diluted results. This is the by far most common mistake that I see sellers making every single day. With print on demand, if you are looking to grow, it is not wise to be a mile wide and an inch deep. It's too shallow. It is going to help you grow when you are only an inch wide and you're a mile deep. A lot of times what this looks like is being product specific as an example. Maybe you are choosing one product type, say mugs, and you become the expert in that product type. You sell that product type in tons of different niches. This is often thought of as a general store, but you're able to really master the product type. And when you are able to master the product type, you're able to understand what works best and expand in that product type and expand your shop and see a lot of growth with it. Another strategy that you could try to really dial in that focus for your shop would be to be niche specific. This would entail creating multiple different product types, but only for one chosen niche, allowing you to have a constant. The constant here is the niche, 
and that is what you are looking to become the expert in. Both strategies, product specific or niche specific, have a constant variable in each. One is the product type, one is the niche, and that allows you to treat it like a science experiment. And you're going to be able to test other different variables and get a lot more accurate data as to what is and isn't working because you have the constants in place to really assess the progress that you're making. Both of these though are strategies that when implemented consistently, you will see results. I have mentioned tons of different resources throughout this video, so be sure to check out the description as it's gonna be jam packed with tons of different links to articles that I've mentioned throughout this video, as well as any video resources that I have that will dive deeper into how to prevent these mistakes and what you can do to help grow your print on demand business. I will also be sure to add the link to all of my coaching opportunities. I offer a few different one-on-one -on -one coaching opportunities where we can do a shop audit on your shop and come up with a specific game plan and key takeaways for you to implement to grow your business or consider checking out the POD Connection, which is my group mentorship. We have a lot of fun over there. We do monthly calls, live Q and A calls, master classes. There's a community of like-minded individuals and we have the ability to work together in that group to come up with a strategy for you to get your first sales or get your thousandth sale, no matter where you are in your journey. All experience levels are welcomed. I hope to see you in there. Let me know in the comments if you have made any of these mistakes. I know I have. That's how I know that they are mistakes because I've made many of them and had to make adjustments to grow my business. But let me know which one was helpful for you to hear. And as always, I hope you're having a wonderful morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. And I will see you in the next one. Bye.